And this is actually very interesting. This is breaking stuff here. I'm going to share with you that almost no one's heard yet. We were able to find that grip strength was directly predictive of brain health because the neurological demand of strength training is very, very high, which means you continue to keep neurological pathways activated and healthy. Most people listening are saying when they think about neurological support, they're worrying about dementia, right? They're worrying about Alzheimer's. They're worrying what's going to happen. Are you saying that lifting really heavy weights is actually protective against that? Welcome to Zoe Science and Nutrition, where world-leading scientists explain how their research can improve your health. As we get older, our bodies get progressively weaker, putting us at risk of frailty and even early death from diseases like dementia and heart disease. That's why staying physically active is so important for longevity. But what is the best type of exercise to keep us fit? And can it really prolong our healthy years? Professor Andy Galpin joins us today to demystify a vast array of options and to help us choose the best exercises to support our health. Andy is a professor of kinesiology at California State University, Fullerton, and an expert in exercise and human performance science. He's also the author of the best-selling book, Unplugged. Andy, thank you for joining me today. That's a pleasure to be here. So why don't we start with a quick fire round of questions from our listeners? And this is a tradition now on the show. And we have some quite strict rules, which we know professors always find a little challenging. And the rules are you can say yes or no, or if you have to, maybe, or even a one sentence answer if you really have to. Are you up for it? Yeah, actually, I have to tell you, I like this. All right, let me start. Is there one correct fitness routine for all of us? No. Are most of us doing the wrong exercises to maximize our health? No. Okay. We had a great email from one of our listeners saying that she's always gone to the gym, but now that she's postmenopausal, it feels like nothing really works anymore and her body is changing. So the question is, do you need to change your exercise program as you age? That's a loaded question, but I'm going to say no. Okay. Brilliant. Should women and men do different exercises as they get older? No. Is cardio exercise more important than strength training for healthy aging? No. I get a lot of no's. All right, I'm going to let you off now. You don't have to say yes or no. You can have no, a whole keep going. sentence this is great. or two. I'd love for you to tell me what's the biggest misconception that you often hear about exercise? I would probably say that it's a similar answer uh, with the mind frame you put me in with those previous questions. And I'm, what I mean by that is that there is a singular magic specific thing that all people have to be doing. Whether this is style of training, whether this is intensity you have to be at, whether this is a uh, number of days, this is an exercise. Uh, thinking that there is one thing all of us have to do or really, really, really should be doing or is critically more important than others. Uh, if I had to summarize it for the people I think are listening here, that would be my answer is the biggest misconception. And it's it's not true. There isn't like this one thing that everyone has to do. There's a lot of ways to get to the places you need to be at, whether you're young, post pause, male, female, busy, not busy, any of those things. It's not necessarily always about the exercise or uh, the style of training or the amount of days or the intensity. It's the fundamental physiological challenge that you're trying to place in the body. You got a lot of ways to get there. And so you want to think about it more uh, in that term than it is. If I can give you a very quick analogy, uh, it would be akin to if this was a finance podcast and you said, how much money does the average person in uh, the UK need to have before retiring? And I would say, okay, that's a number. That's different than you saying, what job should I do to retire? What job should you, oh, I don't know. There's a thousand ways to stack your money up. You just have to get to this amount of money. That's what we're talking about here. And so you can make your money early. You can make it late in life. You can make a little bit all the way. You could do all the way. I could give you all kinds of examples here. What matters though is do you get to the certain end point? So once you get to a million pounds in the bank account, you can retire or whatever the number is, right? doesn't matter. Um, so that's really the better way to think about this is you need to accrue certain physiological skills and abilities. How you get there, it's infinite possibilities. Before we jump in to learn all about the best exercises for your health, I have a favor to ask. 63% of people that watch this podcast haven't hit the subscribe button. And 11% of you haven't yet hit the bell to turn notifications on. 
We want this podcast to reach as many people as possible as we continue our mission to improve the health of millions. So if you've ever enjoyed this podcast, please hit the subscribe button and turn notifications on. Doing us this small favor really will help. Thank you. Now, just before we run through, I should probably like state, and, and a lot of listeners will know this, that I do rec- exercise regularly. I have a trainer who I uh, certainly try and see three times a week. And I think most people listen, like they know that exercise is important for the health. It's also shrouded in a lot of terminology and complexity that can make it hard to approach and and really confusing, you know, particularly for those of us who aren't professors. I'd love to like maybe just unpack right at the beginning some of that. And actually, can I start with the the, the new burning question that I have with the new bit of terminology that I only discovered uh, in the last few weeks? You are a professor of kinesiology. Can you explain to us in simple words, what is kinesiology? Well, the end of that word, ology, anytime you hear that, this means the study of. And kines, can I, can I am like that, means movement. So it's just the study of movement. So this is kinesthetics. This is, um, in general, kinematics, kinetics, all those things are coming from the same thing. So globally, it just happens to be the name of our department where it's all things human movement. And so what that means is, if you think about it, I am one of the directors for our Center for Sport Performance here. So what that means is we are dedicated to sport performance, but from the movement side of the equation. There's a lot of different ways to think about kinesiology. It's, it's movement for everybody, but my specific lane is movement for sport performance. The terms that I'd love for you just to help unpack uh, are maybe the three terms that we hear most commonly. So one is just this word fitness. The other is this word cardio. And the other one is this strength training. Could you just help us to understand like... How do those interrelate? Um, what do they mean? The first one, fitness, depends on where you're at uh, a little bit. So initially, if you go back to the history of our field, one of the reasons why it's called kinesiology is because it started on, actually, Karolinska Institute for the most part, and Sweden started it. And definitions come generally from where they start. And so fitness scientifically means specifically referring to your VO2 max, your maximal aerobic capacity. Cardio uh, training is really supposed to refer to the word cardio, right? Which is uh, a way to say your cardiovascular system or your, specifically your heart. And so cardio is referred to kind of anything that is more conditioning or endurance based. It tends to be longer duration where the physical challenge on your part, the point of failure is the way to think about it, is not necessarily your ability to pick something up, push it, pull it, or move it one time. It's about repeating over time. So in this case, failure is fatigue, right? Ran out of energy, pain got too high couldn't take another step. And that's kind of the way to think about cardio. Strength is generally the opposite, where the the failure point was it was too heavy, right? For whatever reason, I couldn't do it. Lost technique, lost position, things like that. Now, in my courses, I'll actually challenge that notion quite a bit because there's just simply no type of exercise you can do that does not involve the cardiovascular system. Point blank, right? You can't do it. Um, You can imagine actually doing like a one rep max deadlift. One of the things people don't realize is your blood pressure, if you're healthy, at rest is something like 120 over 80. It is the numbers that you get to, right? So 120 over 80 is a systolic and diastolic. During a one repetition maximum deadlift or um, squat, which or means like just that, trying to lift the heaviest thing you can, but you only need to do it once. Just yeah, or even if you did it twice or three times, like so one rep, just like a very, 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 very heavy one, like the highest you can lift. Um, your blood pressure might reach as high as like 450 over 350. And so you can quadruple your blood pressure instantaneously, which means you're actually basically getting full occlusion, which means you're blocking blood flow the entire system. It's a great way to, to reduce uh, blood pressure for those that are high. Um, isometric exercise is super effective for reducing blood pressure, chronic blood pressure. If you get to a position where your blood pressure is that high, your cardiovascular system in response to that will beat extensively high because it's trying to get um, blood through uh, the tissue that is now being clogged down and blocked. And so um, and anyone again that doesn't exercise like that, you're going to set the bar down and instantaneously your, your heart rate will be as high as, as one can imagine. Now, it comes down pretty quickly afterwards. Um, so the point is I'm being a little bit facetious here, but it's just really challenging to do any form of exercise without having some cardiovascular and So the so line between kind of cardio and strength training has traditionally been like, okay, I lift some weights and then I run or I swim or yep. cycle. At the highest level, fine. You want to think about it. 
But that does really, honestly, a disservice to people because it makes them think like either I lift weights or I run for an hour and anything else in between is not exercise. And that's just really, really problematic because it dissuades people away from tons of other activities that are as good for you, if not better for you, than those two extremes. So um, it, it's the way you said earlier, sometimes because of that, when people have too many options, it actually makes things worse. It's it's scary. It's intimidating. It's like, it's confusion. I don't know what to do. So I just won't do it. So I get that part of it. If it's easier to just tell people, hey, just do this or this and limit your choices. So it's a little bit more relieving. That's fine. But I want to flip that on his head a little bit and say, because it is that way, gives you the option. You can do so many different things. You don't have to worry about, oh my gosh, if I'm doing this style and I like it a lot, is it even effective? The answer is yes, it will definitely be effective. And that's why I answered those rapid fire questions the way I did, because if you're working out and you're you're doing it hard, even kind of hard, and you're doing it consistently, it's working. You're saying that like most things are in some sense a combination of both this sort of cardio, which you're describing as like you're doing it over and over for a long time, uses your heart, and like the strength, which is like this is something heavy and like difficult to just do a few times. And you're saying that in reality, most things are actually a mix of both, and therefore you're getting the benefits of both as long as the exercise isn't too easy? No, I'm saying it can be. I'm saying lots of things can be, yeah. So you have tons of options. If you have a certain routine that you like or a certain style or things you don't like, then we can find success with those limitations, I guess. So I want it to be more of like letting folks know you have tons of options. You said one other thing that I never heard before. I was I was intrigued to make sure I don't say. You said that fitness came originally from like these studies in sort of Swedish university a long time ago, and it was very much associated um, with basically sort of. Uh, you, you said this VO2 max, which I think is like this measurement, right, of sort of the maximum oxygen that you can use. If I understood from previous podcasts, so it's very much sort of about cardio. And is that right? And does that explain why for a lot of people when, you know, they think about fitness, it's very associated with going for a run, being able to do something for a very long time. And that for many people, I think they don't think about strength at all, really, as part of what being fit is. Yeah. that's So that's a really nice way to think about it. Fitness itself, again, generally scientifically refers to just the VO2 max portion. So the maximum amount of oxygen you can bring in and utilize this is your highest heart rate stuff. This is high intensity intervals. This is um, whether it's longer duration stuff, but it is the conditioning, the endurance, the fatigue inside of the equation. But that doesn't mean you have to always be at your maximum effort to be working on that stuff. So it could be, you know, going for a light jog, could be going for a brisk walk, could be gardening. Tons of things you can do that are still going to be working on that fitness component without necessarily being at the maximum fitness rate. But the way that we would measure your fitness would be. What is that maximum number? And so explain to me just for a minute, how would you measure that? Because it sounds like you've come around to that quite a bit. How would you me measure somebody's fitness? Yeah, tons of ways you can do it. The The gold standard is to actually get a VO2 max test done. And they're available actually all over the place, all over the world. And it's getting more and more popular because of how critically important it is to both overall health, how long you're going to live, uh, as well as how well you're going to live those, those years. So both components there. Or... You can do a thousand different versions of free uh, measures. So there's all kinds of VO2 max estimators. Uh, a lot of fitness wearables will give you a rough idea as well. A lot of them are, you know, not necessarily always perfectly accurate, but they'll get you close. There are, uh, again, two minute step tests you can do. Literally, you can measure your heart rate, um, do a kind of standardized step test where you're stepping up on a very low box and stepping down for two minutes and measure your heart rate. This is sub maximal. So you don't even need to go all the way to the max, but. Um, we have enough information to say, if you get this much of a heart rate elevation in this much time, we can project out to where the top will be. And a lot of times with um, folks that are not comfortable or uh, willing or wanting to go all the way to the true max, an estimate, a sub-max, again, the term you want to Google is sub-max um, estimate equation. Those are out there. But lots of ways you can do this. Um, another kind of standard easy test is run a mile and a half and record your time. And then you can plug that number in. And that'll give you another pretty good way to estimate your VO2 max. So um, it typically takes eight to 12 minutes, plus or minus, to get one done. But again, you can do a sub max one in two minutes if you want, or that's why a mile and a half run is actually, you know, a pretty good thing too. So gives you, you know, 2,400 meters will give you a pretty good idea of, of where you're at. Let's say somebody does this and they're using this to figure out their level of, of fitness. Um, how can it help and what does it mean? If you want to figure out how long you're going to live, 
there's a lot of ways you can measure how healthy you are now, and then also project out to how healthy you need to be at a certain age. And so let's just say you're 60 years old now, and you want to live to be 100. Okay, great. Well, if I know how fit you are now, um, since we know that there is going to be a decline in physical fitness, no matter what you do, it's going to happen with aging. So I can say, okay, if you want to be at A right now, and we know you're going to drop X percent over the years, this means it's going to put you at B by the 40 years from now. And so the number you want to think about is this. Uh, for men, around 20 milliliters per kilogram per minute or so <clears throat> is what we call the age of in, or line of independence. And for women, that is about 16 or so milliliters per kilogram per minute. These will make sense when you go to your VO2 access. When you fall below these lines, it becomes very difficult to be independent, meaning you can't live by yourself. And so you have to be in an assisted living home of some sort or have somebody in your house. Like that. Okay, great. So if you are at 60 years old, and right now your VO2 max on your test is 23, you're fine now, but you have nowhere to go. You can also look at a ton of, uh, you know, Peter Atia actually did this in his book, uh, Outlive, I think is this called. And he walks you through what uh, fitness levels are required for different activities. Just uh, climbing upstairs, putting your own luggage, um, you know, on a bus and stuff like that. And and a lot of these activities take between twenty five to thirty milliliters per kilogram per minute. So if you're already you know going to walk around it, and let's make it worse, let's say you're fifty years old, you're a fifty year old male, and your VO two max is forty one. Like you have nowhere to go. You've got the next fifty. You're halfway through life, and you're barely already able to climb stairs. Like you're just above the, you know, you got 20%, doesn't feel that bad. But we know you're going to reduce, um, you know, every decade you're going down. And so you, you just don't have anywhere to go. You certainly don't have 50 more years. And so the only option here is to just never move your physical body, which we know is not going to last very long, or to improve that VO2 max. Now, what's also interesting about VO2 max is, is one of the very few metrics we have that scales linearly. So if we took anyone in the world and we took all their VO2 max and we split them up into say the top 25%, next 25%, next 25%, and then the bottom 25%. If you go from the bottom 25% to just the group above you, right? Your expected life, like how long you're going to live is probably going to go up five to eight years. Wow. By just moving up like a tiny bit. I'm not even talking about getting super fit, transforming your life, just not being the worst, uh, most unfit people on the planet. You just you don't want to be in that number. Now that five eight years could be wildly different depending on what age group you look like. It might be even way higher than that, and some could be lower. But the point is, it is a dramatic reduction in your risk of dying. Dramatic reduction. If you go up to the next one, it continues to reduce. Up to the next one, it continues to reduce, and then it goes up from the even the almost most fit to most fit. It can st- it continues to increase your lifespan. And so this is when I say. It. There's no cost to just getting higher and higher and higher. It's not one of those things where it's like, well, if you get too high, it actually starts making you unhealthy. It doesn't. It just continues to go up higher. So if you are in the 30s, I don't need you to be in the 90s for sure. But if you can get from the 30 to 38, this gives you many years in your life. 38 to 45, this gives you, you probably have talked, you know, at least a decade on your life. And it's critical here. And last thing I'll say, and I'll pause. It's not just a decade. It's a decade of well living. That goes on in your life. So it is high functioning 10 years rather than just, you know, sitting around on a chair. So uh, it's super, super important to move this thing. In fact, if you take, uh, and you could, you could do this, you could do health test roulette. You could pick any test in the world you want, full body MRI, blood pressure, smoking history, cholesterol, familial background, put any metric in the world on a roulette table and spin it around. Almost nothing in the world will predict how long you're going to live more than your VO2 max number, with the exception of maybe one thing, and that would be your overall strength. Um, when you stack up strength to VO2 max, it is generally in the same ballpark, if not exceeds the ability to predict how long you're going to live. And when, again, we're, not, we're talking all-cause mortality, so die for any reason. Strength, depending on the study you look at, and when I'm talking about this, I'm talking about studies that include tens of thousands of people, sometimes hundreds of thousands of people, so not like a single cohort of six people like a random study you're you know, cherry picking here. Uh, I'm trying to globally represent 20 years of research. That's why I'm kind of so so confident and brazen about this is because this is not like a study. This is, this is so well documented. Um, so if you were to get a rough 
a crude estimate of your overall strength and your VO2 max. These two things are going to tell you more information about how long and how we're going to live than almost anything you could ever measure. And Andy, I was about to ask about what next, but then you suddenly like from left field said, oh, well, this is really important. But also your strength is at least as important. Is there an equivalent measure um, that someone can can do to understand like what the status of their strength is? Yeah. So generally we think about this, legs are most important. And so there's, there's a bunch of reasons why, but weak legs is very problematic. Now, one of the things we know is leg strength is more important to longevity than leg size. So muscle mass is cool and we need to have muscle, but the strength is more important than how much muscle you have for, for longevity here. So one of the things that becomes a problem is as people's legs get weaker as they age, they start declining general physical activity. And so if you can think about it this way, if standing up out of a chair is like, you know, doing a squat at 95% of your max, then you're not likely to stand up out of that chair very often because every time it's, it's like doing a one or at max, right? And so people whose legs get weak tend to lose physical activity, which means they stop going out with their friends. They won't go on that lunch thing. Um, so they lose, lose social connectivity. They don't go to the kids' soccer, the grandkids soccer game because it's just going to be so hard to sit in that stadium with those deep chairs and like you can see the things, right? And I'm not going to go out and do this. I'm going to start ordering my food in. I'm not even going to go to the grocery store anymore. Like just all the things start happening. So physical activity starts to plummet. So we lose social connectivity. We lose being outside. And we also lose the actual just physical benefits of being physically active, right? So then those tangential things as well as the direct ones. So the leg strength to stop yourself from doing that um, is, a, is a huge deal. And I can go on and on and on. But losing leg strength is a really big problem for aging. So how do you test it? Well, any test of leg strength um, will work. Uh, a leg press machine, a leg extension machine, um, any of those things are, are generally fine. But I'll go even easier for you. There's a lot of research, a ton of research on grip strength. So grip strength is also an independent and significant predictor of all-cause mortality. How strong your grip is, is going to tell us a ton about how you're going to live. And this is actually very interesting. This is breaking stuff here. I'm going to share with you that almost no one's heard yet. So a lot of people think, oh, okay, grip strength is a good predictor of mortality. And this is um, irrefutable, by the way. It's all over the scientific literature. So no one really questions when this is true. But people will say, oh, okay, grip strength is just a proxy for how overall healthy you are. So generally healthy people are probably even generally. And that's fine. That's true. But there's more and more research coming out showing there is actually a direct cause here. And so actually a paper we just published in the last month or so found a couple of things. And we actually did this in the uh, in the States. There's a, there, the UK has this too, but um, I'm presumably other countries do as well. But you have these giant databases of public uh, health studies that happen every single year for decades. And, and the one here in America is called N. Haynes. Uh, and it's been going on for over 30 years. And so you have thousands of people enroll in these studies. They collect them, uh, all kinds of stuff from IQ to personality to physical stuff and blood and, and work and all kinds of things. And then the government throw them in these big databases and they, they give it open access to scientists to say like, hey, if there's anything you can pull out of here, you know, grab it. So there's the UK Bile Bank and, and Haynes over here and things like that. So we went into that database. We were able to find that grip strength was directly predictive of brain health and, and, and more specifically your cognitive health. And this is the first time it's been documented as, as likely causal. So it's not just the fact that, well, as people that were smarter had stronger hands. Like, well, how does that make sense? <laughs> There's no causal that way. And so the causal is this thing. And the reason why is because of the neurological component. So strength training is very specific and different than cardiovascular training because the neurological demand of strength training is very, very high which means you continue to keep neurological pathways activated and healthy. You need those neurological pathways to make decisions and think and to keep your brain alive. So by challenging your ability to physically do something, um, that is either complex or complicated or requires a lot of force, like a lot of strength. That requires neurological activation. That requires those things to stay alive and healthy. I'm like totally shocked to hear this. I think you're saying that you know, we all have this idea that if you had to do the crossword puzzle or like serve some sort of complex um, task, like that's going to keep your brain working. But I think you're saying something that doesn't sound at all obvious to me, which is if you have to do something like lift something that's really heavy, that is also going to keep my brain having to think? 100%. Uh, in fact, the research on this one specifically, you mentioned crossword puzzles, brain games or what things like that are called. 
they're good. The problem is once you figure those things out, continuing to do them is no longer neurologically protective. And so it's the novelty aspect that that is really important. And so um, this is the same for folks who have really cognitively demanding jobs. And they're like, oh, no, no, I'm fine because my job is really stressful. Well, actually, after a number of years of continuing to do it, it's, it may be stressful, but it's no longer cognitively challenging, despite what you may think it is. And so you need to add some novelty in there. So the crossword puzzle thing is like, great, but in, in, uh, after a while, it's no longer going to have the, the neuroprotective benefits um, that it once did. Strength training will almost always have them. Even though I feel like lifting up, I, I mean, no disrespect, but I feel like I might lift a weight up from the ground that I've still been doing that. It doesn't feel very cognitively challenging. I know it's going to sit there. I need to lift it up. Help, help me to understand, like it doesn't work with crossword puzzles. How does it work with lifting something heavy off the ground? How, how do you actually lift something up off the ground? Well, there's three major steps to that. Going on the inverse here, you actually are, let's just say you're gripping something, right? You're holding onto something with your hand. You're trying to stand up with it. That means you're trying to make bones move, right? Human movement is making bones move, period. Now, how do bones move? Well, muscle is not actually attached to bone. That's a misconception. Muscle comes together, attaches to connective tissue and tendons, tendons attached to bone. So step number one is, I'm going in reverse order on purpose here. You have to get connective tissue to pull on a bone. So connective tissue, number one. It's number three, but you get it. I'm saying going backwards here. Let's call it number three. Number two, then, is you had to have muscle contract. Now, how does muscle contract? Something has to tell it to contract. That would be your central nervous system, friends, and your peripheral nervous system. This is your brain, right? Call it your brain up here, extend it all out, call it nervous system. Same, same thing here, right? And so, really, you have to tell your nervous system, make this specific thing contract on this timing at this exact time. Now, since that's a heavy load, that's just really, really heavy, the only way you can increase force production, individual muscles themselves cannot change how much force they produce. It's called the all or none principle. Muscle fibers can only contract at 100% effort. That's it. You can't go 95, 93. There's no dimmer switch. It is fully on or fully off. So muscle fibers only go 100%. So the only way you increase your total force production, so how much force you're lifting you know, your arm with, is to turn on more total muscle fibers. This means more motor units. This means more nerves is the way to think about this. So as you go to pick up that very light thing, you turn on just a couple of nerves. No problem. That medium thing, got to turn on more. That heavy thing, got to turn on more. That heaviest thing, got to turn on the most possible. Now those nerves are specific to that force production, which means when you don't do anything that's kind of heavy, you never, ever, ever, ever under any circumstance, turn on those nerves that are dedicated to kind of heavy. When you never go really, really heavy, those nerves never get turned on. And so after many, 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 many years and decades, they eventually die and go away. When you're talking about crosswords, great. It is still cognitively active in the moment, but we're not accessing a broad spectrum a neuromuscular connection throughout the entire body that says, hey, there's a certain set of neurons that are dedicated to this type of activity that haven't been activated in a long time. When you strength train, it is doing that, right? You're going to get a whole bunch of nerves that activate muscle contraction at a low level doing any daily physical activity, walking, standing, taking a bowel movement. All those things are going to do those activities of daily living. But the only way to get what are called those higher threshold motor units is to do something that is a higher threshold. And a higher threshold, again, means force production. So we have a whole cascade of neural activation dedicated to just force production. It's there. The only way really to do this is force production. This is why strength training is so special. It's one of the many reasons. And Andy, I think that's it's amazing. I, I have to admit, I had thought that like doing a deadlift, you know, like which is lifting something heavy off the ground, seems incredibly straightforward from the brain's perspective. Because as you said, it's just sitting there. If you wait for a while, it's still just sitting there. You know, you have to lift it up. And I'd never thought about it as being like <laughs> anything like as complicated as you described. Uh, so you're describing all of these neurons that have to work. Do they have, I think most people listening are saying when they think about neurological support, they're worrying about dementia, right? They're worrying about Alzheimer's. They're worrying what's going to happen. Are you saying that like this um, lifting really heavy weights is actually protective against that? Oh, 100%. 100%. Uh, and not to say it can protect you 
<laughs> but um, now you have a couple of different ways to think about this, right? So on one hand, you have things like Parkinson's, which are mostly, they're neurological, but they're mostly musculature based, right? There's a cognitive component of Parkinson's, but it is a mostly like, you, see, you have spasticity and muscle control. Then you have things like Alzheimer's. You have early onset and late onset, and you have dementia, okay? Now, if we think about early onset Alzheimer's, that seems to be almost exclusively, well, I should, I don't know how to say this, but it's, it's very heavily driven by unknown factors, probably genetics, right? If you get Alzheimer's in your 30s or 40s, there's no amount of strength training that was probably going to help that. It's just there. Dementia and late onset Alzheimer's is extremely preventable, extremely preventable. Uh, again, tons of research on that. Um, I can't remember the actual numbers, but it is a large percentage of those things are preventable because of this. And it is a combination, by the way, is of physical activity, sensory perception, which means you need to be seeing things at a different distance. You need to be smelling different things. You need to be hearing different things. This is one of the reasons why the research on being out in nature is so potent, because it requires you to see and look at things at a different level. You're, you're, the vision and light amount is different. You're hearing different sounds. All that actually goes into what's called proprioception and sensory input. And so you have, you know, your all your senses, right? Your your sight, smell, touch, sound, all those things, right? It's the same thing I talked about. When nervous system is not activated, it goes away. Your nervous system is your brain. Like so, when that goes away, then you like then why are you, like your brain goes away? This this is dementia, right? This is this is what's happening. And I think we tend to have this view that the two are completely different. I think you know, and I think we've tended to think that. And what you're saying is that's wrong. That by losing all of these physical skills that you have with your brain, this is basically directly linked to the things that affect our memory and our you know ability to make sense of the world and these sort of I guess higher thinking uh, as we would think about it, separate from sort of controlling our body. I mentioned grip strength being a predictor earlier. A new paper just came out in the last month or so that looked at asymmetry of strength. So how strong is your right hand compared to your left hand? And no one had ever really thought about this, but the amount of asymmetry is defined as more than 10%. More than 10% is actually potentially an early predictor of nerve denervation. And so what they're saying here basically is, it's not just that your, your, your dominant hand is stronger than your left hand. Okay, great. If it's more than 10% stronger, it may be an early indication of neurological um, degradation. I know not that you're losing nerve, but you, it's denervation specifically. But the point is, it could be actually, it's not just about a, like, you can't open a jar with your left hand. Oh, no worries. It is, hey, this might be an early sign something is happening. Hi, I want to take a quick break here and tell you about something new we've created. A free guide that will kickstart your journey to a better gut health. We feed our gut microbiome through the variety of foods we eat. And in return, our microbes give us a wealth of health benefits. They're responsible for so much, from digestion to immune support and even our mental well-being. So how can you nurture your gut in the best way? Which food swaps can you try to nourish these good bacteria? What does a high fiber shopping list look like? Our free gut health guide shares it all. Emails and actionable tips that are designed to put you in control of your gut health. To get yours for free, simply go to zoe.com slash gut guide. You'll also find the link in the show notes. I'd, I'd love to come back. You mentioned something about blood pressure earlier, and there'll be a lot of people listening to this who are also worrying about blood pressure because it is something that's very easy to measure. So it tends to be something that people become aware of. Uh, and you said something about isometric exercise, but I don't know what that is. Could you help us to understand? Yeah, sure. So this is going to tie together nicely. There's been a number of studies that have specifically looked at the impact of just grip strength training. There's no warm-up required. You don't have to change. You can squeeze something as hard as possible. These are called hand grip dynamometers. They're fairly cheap. You can get them for 25, 35 bucks. So no cardio, no straight. You grow in and you squeeze and you hold these things. That's all you do. Uh, typically something like six to eight second, uh, maybe a little bit longer contraction. So squeeze as hard as you can, just your grip. You know, you do some eight to, I can't remember exactly, eight to probably 12 or so repetitions of that a couple days a week. And those have been shown statistically significant reductions in resting blood pressure in people that are hypertensive. So people that have chronic high blood pressure um, over you know six to eight to 10 weeks, something like that. So grip strength training alone um, is an isometric contraction. So you're grabbing and you're squeezing and you're holding it. What that's doing is because all the muscles or many of them in a muscle group or around a joint are contracting, 
you're kind of squeezing all the vessels at the same time, which means blood can't go anywhere, right? So it kind of gets, it's what we call occluded or stuck, it stops moving. So in the short term, your blood pressure shoots through the roof because you can imagine you're trying to circulate blood throughout your body. And when it's coming out of your heart, it's getting squeezed down by all the muscles. So it can't go anywhere. So the pressure in the heart gets really, really, really high because all the blood gets backed up, but it's pumping and it's pumping and it's trying to get it out of there. And so the pressure gets super, super high. In response to that, your body then will say effectively, hey, we're having this consistent challenge. Let's make the vessels more pliable, more elastic, more plastic, open them up more. By doing that at rest, now the blood pressure, the pressure at rest goes down because it's easier to get stuff through. And so almost always, this is what we call a hormetic response. And so the body tends to work very well on short, very hard disturbances in homeostasis or kind of the resting state match with recovery. And so if you get your blood pressure up really, 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 really high in the short term, and then you bring it back down and let it rest a lot, it will respond by causing an adaptation. I, I feel like quite a lot of people understand now that, you know, if you go and do exercise, then it like, it actually can damage your muscles in the short term, but actually that makes you, you know, help, you know, it helps you to build them that this is tension. I think what I'd never heard of you saying is it's sort of something equivalent for your blood pressure. It's almost like you put the blood pressure up high in your body and actually magically effectively it's like oh i'm learning from this to make adaptations is actually going to reduce my blood pressure your brain works the same way you do something really challenging you do your crossword you, you solve a really hard problem you you just get locked in and you write for 90 minutes you do whatever it is right and then you recover and what happens uh, motor control and motor learning by the way doesn't happen during acute stress so when you're trying to learn a new physical task or you're trying to learn something new, a new language, you're trying to solve a really hard problem you've been working on, in that moment, stress levels are way too high. You just go on super alert. That When you come down from that stress moment though, that's when the new learning gets set in stone. Physical learning, cognitive learning, all that. So it's the same thing. Really high pressure, really high fatigue, tons of stress in the system cognitively. Then when you relax, recover, new systems, new memories, new strategies, get built in the brain. It's the same of all of them. I don't want people to think, by the way, everything in your life has to be to level 10. All these things I'm talking about, by far, the biggest benefit, by far, is going from the bottom 25th percentile to just the next level up. It, it is not you know, level three to level one. It, it does not matter at all. Just going from, in fact, it gets even worse, just going from the bottom 15th percentile to one percentile groove up is the biggest gains you're going to see in your health of all of these groups. And so if someone is, is, you know, run 20 marathons and they're trying to get a PR the next one, they want to get more fit, um, that will make them a little bit healthier. Maybe, maybe not. They're, they're going to get marginal gains, right? Going okay. from- Doesn't really, worst, doesn't really matter. It's not a huge deal, but you will yeah. have a, again, you'll put years of your life just being not the worst, least strong, least fit person, you know, in the entire city. And I'm very specific in all my examples to use percentages. Because everything is relative. I don't talk about the weight you have to lift. I don't talk about the, it's a percentage, right? So if, if you go to the gym and you know you, you, go, you don't know what you're doing, you find one machine and you lift it and it feels kind of heavy. I don't care if it's six pounds. Kind of heavy is still kind of heavy. It is the same thing for you physically. So you're getting the same thing that I'm getting while lifting kind of heavy if I have 600 pounds. On. It's irrelevant. It doesn't matter at all. And so it is always about just the individual person. And so um, when I say speed or when I say strength, or when I say like as hard as possible, if you walk off that thing and go like that is the fastest I could possibly move it, then you're getting the exact same benefit I'm getting or anybody else's. It, it is always about your internal physiology and your internal system. If it's being challenged, it adapts. If it's not being challenged, it won't. You don't have to challenge things. We always say this. So think about it. You don't want to annihilate. You just want to stimulate. Okay, stimulate progress, stimulate adaptation, but you don't have to annihilate. In fact, there's excellent research on annihilation gives you no more progress than stimulation. If you want to think about this in terms of muscle growth. So the amount of soreness you get after uh, you know going through a hypertrophy or muscle growth training is not a predictor at all of how much growth you will actually get. In fact, if you go to what is called reps and reserve, and so say you had a weight on a machine and you did eight reps and you think I had two repetitions maybe I could have done like maybe like two or three more 
stopping right there is actually almost as effective as doing those last two more reps. It is about basic stimulation. Um, and this is why when we open up the conversation, and I'm glad we're kind of closing at the same spot is, um, I really do want to let people know like you have so many options. If you love going to the class and it's a group fitness class and you have kettlebells and you do some sprints and you lift and then you, you're all on the floor sweating everywhere, you rip your shirts off and you throw a great. If you hate that stuff, you don't have to do a day of that ever. If you like jogging, amazing. If you hate jogging, great too. If you want to do yoga in your in your apartment, okay, awesome. Like, and you want to just follow along with uh, uh, someone on Instagram Live for the yoga. All of those are options. The biggest key that everyone has to get to, though, like by far, every single person, you want consistency over time. Adherence is the number one predictor of success with fitness and nutrition programs. Always adherence. When you talk about this across the lifespan, you have to remember the benefits of exercise are so compounding over the decades. It's not about this month or this week or this day. You will need to be in this for the decade long thing. And so if you can say consistent over decades, you're going to be fine. It's people that go uh, and they do things to a level and they get hurt and then they miss it. Or they do, you know, they're, they're so motivated to lose their weight or to to you know, change after a bad breakup. These are like very common reasons people start fitness programs. And then you get really hard and you go so hard and you go six days a week and you do two and a half hour workouts and you do that for six weeks and then you're just like, okay, I haven't hung out with a friend. My company's going out of business. Like, I can't, this is not sustainable. Because it's not. And it, you don't need to do that. And so put yourself in a position where you just don't lose big chunks of training. A day or two, fine. You want to go on a week vacation, fine, no problem. I'm talking about months. Right, where it's like, oh yeah, I gotta have it. It's been, well, no, it hasn't been that long, but I, geez, I guess it has been seven weeks now that I haven't worked out. I, it didn't feel like, that. and all of a sudden it just, it felt like, oh, because I hurt my back a little bit. And then I had that trip. And then I had the, and then all of a sudden, but then I got a cold and so I skipped four days there. And now it's been seven weeks. And now you gotta get started all over again. So you, you just don't want these big ones. And so what I always, uh, another way to think about this is don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Just get something in. Just, just, just do something. If, if all you can do is get a couple of walks in. A lot of people listening will say by this point, they've got, they've accumulated quite a lot of injuries in their life. They're, you know, they're not just going to feel that they can be let loose in a, in a gym. And so I think they often say, well, so I can't really do any strength training because like, I don't have the capacity to sort of just go and, um, you know, lift a heavy weight over my head or something. Does that mean, is it too late for them to do um, strength training? Does that mean that it's, it's impossible if you've if you've accumulated injuries. No, it's, it's completely possible. If you can stand up from a chair or a couch or a toilet, then you're doing a leg extension. It's the same thing, right? It, it, you can you can do whatever. Um, work around your injuries for sure, and do the parts that you can do. Um, or if you just don't like the gym environment for a billion reasons, it's too far, too expensive. If there's another way you can do exercise that is not just walking. Get in a pool. Okay, great. There's going to be some contraction going on there. Um, put your back against the wall and just hold whatever angle you can hold for a while. That's going to be fine um, for, for this type of person you're describing. So um, it's at the beginning, I said, don't worry about the external part. It's all about the internal change. So if you need a machine to help you turn your quad on, great. If you can sit against a wall to turn your quad on, great. Your quad will not know the difference. It has no idea. It doesn't matter. I find that really motivating. I I, I love hearing that. I have one final question because we, we're maybe imagining somebody different who doesn't have any injuries. Um, but what they're saying is like, I'm really time constrained. So, you know, there's a lot of listeners here who have a whole bunch of small children and like they're trying to squeeze this in around the edges of their life or other things in their life, you know, that they're having to balance. So they're like, oh, I'd love to be able to have the time to spend, you know, three hours uh, a week at the gym and go and do some running. But they're, but they're really constrained. If they were if you if they were saying, like, I'd love to understand if I had 15 or 20 minutes, maybe two or three times a week. What are the what are the sorts of exercise? What am I looking to do to make that have this best impact? Given the way you're describing this huge impact it can have on my long term health. Yeah, well, for the record here, I have a five year old daughter and three year old son. I am a full college professor. I coach 
many professional athletes and I have six companies. I'm in the same boat. Like, in the same I, I wish you said that. I wish you said that at the beginning because I had assumed that you were managing, you know, all of that exercise. So, what do you do? Yeah. Okay. So, similar thing. Um, if you put those constraints on there, you want at least once a week, in my opinion, at least once a week, where you can do a longer session with no breaks. Call this steady state. Call it cardio. Call it whatever. So, for Natasha, she's going to go on the spin bike. Great. For me, a lot of times that's on a bicycle and I'm going to ride around outside on a bike, right? I'm going to hop on the bike. I'm not going to, I'm candidly, I'm not going to warm up. I'm not doing any breathing drill. Like I'm going to get on the bike and I'm going to go. I live in Southern California, so it tends to be nice almost every single day. Okay. Um, I try to do that for like a 45 minute ride. Um, I'm literally gone 46 minutes, right? Like I come back in and like minute 46, I'm switching out. I'm grabbing a kid. I'm doing something. I'm getting back on a call. I'm, I'm like, I'm not laying around and I'm getting right back after it. I'd love to go longer, but that's what it is. So one session a week, Natasha does two. Candidly, I'll do one generally. Um, I will then also supplement that with as much general physical walking as I possibly can. Um, this is any call I can take on a walk, I will. Um, if I'm ever traveling, I will I will never sit down during a layover. I have just a four-hour layover. I'm probably going to walk for three hours and 40 minutes, right? I'm, like, I'm just going to get steps in. If I can... When I land, the same thing, like walking, walking, walking as much as I can. I don't like walking at all, but that's just, that is what it is, right? So when can I just get basic steps in? And then one day a week, can I go a little bit longer? One day a week, I'm going to go very, very short, very high intensity. I've got an aerosol bike, um, which is like the hand crank and the, the pedals in my garage, right? So I'm going to do that. Um, that's probably looking like a five to seven minute warm up, and then 10 to 12 minutes um, of any kind of extremely high intensity max effort intervals. This could be 30 seconds as hard as I can, 30 seconds off. Could be four minutes hard, four minutes off, a couple rounds of that. All kinds of stuff you can do. I might just go 10 minutes as hard as I possibly can and come back off of that. In addition, um, I will try to do some sort of strength training at least three times per week. So squats or swings or split squats, uh, presses, sit, like movements, things like that. I know we're coming to the end, so I'd just love to try and do a quick summing up. And you covered a lot of stuff, so um, hopefully I will have, have caught the the essence. And please let me know if I, if I get it wrong. Uh, I think we started by talking a lot about the fact that this, this idea of fitness is both cardio and strength, and there are ways we can measure this. And you talked about this VO2 max test, and we'll, we'll put some uh, links on onto the show notes, which actually is a better way to um, predict um, your long-term health and the quality of your life than most of the things you'll get when you go and see a, a doctor. And there's a sort of scale, I think you said, from 1 to 100, like a super athlete's at 80, people who are really fit are 60 to 70. And basically, as a man, if you fall down to 20 or a woman down to 16, basically, you lose independent living. So you want to stay above that. But I think the really positive thing, because there's something depressing about it falling, is you're saying, actually, if you move just up from the bottom 15% to above that, or if you get out of the bottom quartile, you can have a really profound impact on your long-term health. And there's really things that you can do relatively fast to change your health. So that's one thing that's really interesting, which is sort of on the cardio. And then you talked about something which I think will be even more of a surprise, which is you know, on the strength, you could do something as simple as just measuring your hand grip that there is a machine. I think, did you call it a dynometer? A hand grip dynamometer. Hand grip dynamometer. So we'll definitely find some links to that. In seconds, you can basically this measurement, which is also this amazing predictor of your long-term health. But interestingly, you can actually use it also to reduce your blood pressure. So you can train yourself just with this device. And that can genuinely, I think, again, you said in just a few months, reduce your blood pressure. So this again, there's things you can really do there. We then talked about... Um, how surprisingly the the work you do on strength directly affects your brain and that we tend to think about it as being like you know some brain puzzle or work will will affect your brain but actually amazingly just lifting a really heavy but static object is having all of this impact on your uh neurological system and that can actually reduce your risk of dementia uh, and there's a set of other things that you can do around dementia and we'll, we'll share the link um there and then we talked about, okay, what about if um, you're not, 
you're not really, you don't have all this freedom of movement. Does that mean that all of this is impossible? And actually what you said, which is great, is sort of wherever you are, actually, if you're doing something that is hard for you, you're really going to be having this impact. And that even if you have injuries, there's things that you're able to uh, do. And I think we wrapped up with your own story where you do manage to put in, I would have to say, a very impressive set of exercises through the day. But you're interesting saying, like, actually, these are in lots of pieces. And again, coming back to this original story, like anything we can do across... Um, both this cardio or or the strength is really going to have an impact on people's health. Nailed it. Thank you so much for spending the time with us. My pleasure, man. Thank you, Andy, for joining us on Zoe Science and Nutrition today. We learned what the best exercises are to keep us healthy as we get older and how to incorporate being active into our busy lives. If you want to understand how to support your body with the best foods for you, so you can enjoy many more active and healthy years, then you may want to try Zoe's personalized nutrition program. You can learn more and get 10% off by going to zoe.com slash podcast. As always, I'm your host, Jonathan Wolf. Zoe Science and Nutrition is produced by Yellow Hewins Martin, Richard Willen, and Tilly Fulford. See you next time.